everybody um, to the Pre-Board of Education meeting for Thursday, July 13th. Um, I seem very far away from the podium here. I just fell at Chick-fil-A and my ankle's like this. I've got a bit of bag of ice and the ice on it, so I normally don't sit in La La Land here, but okay. <laughs> so, welcome and um, could you please call the roll? Here. Mr. Morrison? Here. Mr. Donna? Here. Mr. Taylor? Here. Yeah. Could you please stand for the pledge? <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Cincinnati and uh, Georgetown's about an hour east of Cincinnati. Uh, the claim to fame for Georgetown is uh, it's the boyhood home of Ulysses S. Grant. So uh, we take a lot of pride in that. We have uh, annual grant days and, and things like that. So it, it's a drive, but I'm very familiar with this area. I just ate at City Barbecue. Um, <laughs> that's one of my favorite eateries. But uh, coincidentally, it was one of my favorite eateries in, in law school. I, I rushed through my dinner to make it here. <laughs> and uh, but me and my good friend from law school who lived in Fairborn at the time every time we'd have a huge study session we'd either go to Chick-fil-A uh, you had to be on a budget you could do Chick-fil-A uh, City Barbecue then we sometimes get Grater's ice cream so it's like you know that, that was sad to say that you know eating food was your highlight in law school uh, but I, I went to University of Dayton School of Law uh, back in May of 2000 10, I graduated in May of 2012. They have an accelerated program. It's uh, really beneficial. It's beneficial for people like me to get back in the workforce. Before that, I uh, graduated from the University of Cincinnati in 2005 with a degree in finance and real estate. Worked for about five years for a local area member of Congress, which is no longer in office, uh, both in her Cincinnati office and I worked for about a little over two years in Washington. Uh, and so my uh, I didn't do that. Uh, my day job, I'm, a, I'm an assistant prosecutor in Brown County. I uh, have been a prosecutor for almost five years now. So I, I see, you know, I, I like to bring the perspective of that on the State Board of Education is I get to see uh, the unfortunate end products a lot of times of when we don't uh, spend enough time with kids or kids are not given the resources to succeed or most importantly schools aren't given the resources to succeed. So uh, I very much uh, I have a colleague on the State Board of Education uh, by the name of Merle Johnson. She's from um, inner city Cleveland, was a teacher for 40 years there, and she talks a lot about uh, trauma issues and, and things such as, you know, kids don't want to come to school because they don't have clean clothes. And I, uh, I completely agree with Merle, and I tell Merle, I said, um, what we face in rural Ohio is no different than what is faced in urban Ohio. So uh, we like to think uh, that we're doing, making a big difference on the State Board of Education. For those, I didn't really know much about the State Board of Education a while ago, uh, certainly I do now, but for uh, those who are unfamiliar with the State Board of Education, it is made of 19 members, 11 are elected from districts. The districts are a little over a million persons. Uh, three state senate districts, nine house seats. I have, <coughs> excuse me, I have 17 counties. Of course, 
here in Greene County. And then, so 17 counties have 15 poll counties and two partial counties. Of the uh, 19, eight are appointed by the governor. Half the appointment, half the appointed seats, half the elect, elected seats are up at one time. So it's uh, 10, not, 10 one year, or 10 two years, and nine two years later, and vice versa. So we uh, have 10 new members on the State Board of Education this year, five elected members and five appointed members. One of the common things I was uh, frustrated when I was reading about the State Board of Education before I got on was that the dysfunction within the board, and that was one thing that I truly wanted to strive to break down barriers and to work with uh, everyone. Uh, I was very disappointed and I'm sure you guys have read it in the Dayton Daily News. Um, there was always, there always seems to be some sort of consternation about things and I never understood why. And since we got, and since new membership of the board, we've been able to work more collaboratively. I like to think um, we don't have party lines on the state board. I was just talking about uh, one of my colleagues. She's as much Democrat as I am a Republican. But when it comes to kids, doing, doing what's right is in the Republican or Democrat thing. A kid coming to school, um, having experienced horrible trauma at home, or a kid looking for a teacher's helping hand, uh, that isn't a party issue. So that's a little bit of a background on things. I want to just talk on some, uh, some highlights of what's going on in the State Board of Education. Each time I go to a uh, local board meeting, and you guys have a beautiful facility, not everybody has a facility like this. Uh, some, I've seen a few better, but this is probably one of the best. Uh, but what I like to do is uh, I'll give you some of the three or four issues that we're facing right now. And then if anybody has any questions, I brought plenty of business cards. Uh, I'm an open book. My business cards have my email address, my cell phone number. You can find those both on the State Board of Education's website. I always like to say, if you think of your State Board of Education member, which is a rare thing, but if you were to think of your State Board of Education member, please reach out, please uh, contact me, because if, it, if you really went to those lengths to think of me, then it's important. And I, and I want to know about. It. So some of the a few things that we're doing at the State Board of Education level and working in conjunction with the legislature is as many of you guys already know and certainly your treasurer knows, uh, we just finished the uh, state budget process. The uh, budget was signed into law on June 30th and as many of you also know, it's just not about spending the two years worth of state budget money and school funding and things like that like that a lot of policy proposals come out as well. One of the things that uh, hopefully you guys don't have to experience so much but is the class of 2018 as we know will be under new graduation requirements. There's the three paths as, as the law stands now. Uh, it's the 18 points on, out of 35 on seven end of course exams. There's a career tech pathway and also there's a non-remedial score on the ACT or ACT or SAT in both English and math. Well, there's concern as there's been so much inconsistency with testing that it's certainly unfair for the class of 2018 to be experiencing these constant changes. And so we wanted to put uh, forth a path, um, a fair path for those students, but also a path that's accountable. So the superintendent uh, created a work group uh, for the board's uh, direction in December. That work group came back with some recommendations to us. All those recommendations, thankfully, made it into the budget so that uh, seniors have the ability, upcoming seniors now, I guess uh, if you call them still rising seniors until they, they uh, start their first day, they have the ability to, if they don't get those cumulative 18 points on the end of course exams, they will be able to do a, a various thing. I was hoping to bring the list, but I wasn't able to uh, bring all of it. But for instance, if they get 2.5 GPA their senior year, if they get 93% attendance, they pass a college credit plus class, they have work experience, they do 150 hours of credit, uh, community service, and there's a few other things. In, out of, there's about eight or nine options, and they have to do two of them. Now, on top of that, they still have to do take all the end-of-course exams, retake the ones that they didn't succeed on, and also, of course, uh, pass all the local curriculum. So it's my belief, frankly, uh, 
that if a local district thinks a, a kid's ready, who's the state to stand in the way? I mean, it's your local district, I believe, in local control. So hopefully, class of 2018 will be a, a model going forward. We know that the class of 2019 and, the two, and beyond uh, still need to be looked at, and we're hoping through new um, test numbers and to see how these recommendations went uh, to possibly use that for future years. Uh, so those, that recommendation we had went to legislature and was adopted. And then back on assessments, as your administrators know, the state of Ohio requires 24 tests. The federal government requires 17. Well, thankfully in the budget bill, the state legislature did away with two tests, um, the fourth grade and sixth grade social studies test. Now, I'm a big social studies person, I'm an attorney, I love the law, uh, I, I, I know we all have turf battles on the tests um, that get removed, but the social studies wouldn't have been one of my first choices, but I like the idea that we are eliminating tests. We need to give teachers the opportunity to have an enriching environment within the classrooms and to have the ability to truly have a rewarding experience. I, I said in a newspaper article recently, 10 years ago when my peers were graduating from college, they couldn't get a teaching job, could not get a teaching job. Now you have lots of places can't find teachers. It's crazy. Now I think retirements and things like that and the economy at the time had an effect, but also I think that it's been such hard, it's, teaching has not become a desirable thing to come in, at least perception-wise, and I hope that's a change. And by testing the students less and allowing those students to have a more re, uh, rewarding environment with their students, hopefully we can bring more kids in. And on top of that, with teachers and trying to take the handcuffs off of them, the Resident Educator Summative Assessment, RASA, sure if there's any new teachers in here they probably would uh, want to scream and yell uh, that's the additional uh, work that a brand new teacher has to do upon um, becoming a classroom and certainly there's a lot of issues there's a lot of duplicative work for instance the states already did away with the, the students having to fill out the OTES evaluations along the high teacher evaluation system evaluations along with race so that's removed but the real concern was the legislature had actually passed a part of the budget bill doing away with the resident educator program. The governor actually vetoed that. It doesn't seem like the House or Senate are going to override that veto. The Department of Education has made a commitment to the legislature and the governor's office that the RASA program needs to be tweaked, needs to be fixed. But the most important thing we want to keep is mentoring. The last thing we want is uh, students or teachers to be thrown into an environment that they're excited and couldn't wait to start. And they get a whole bunch of misfits in their classroom who are hard to handle at first, and now they start to hate the profession. And that's the last thing we want to do. Now I'm assuming, maybe a big assumption, but I'm assuming places like Beaver Creek have a heck of a mentoring program, and it's not an issue here. But that's where it becomes an issue is in some of my smaller districts. And some of, and, and lots of rural Ohio, because unfortunately budget cuts happen, and sometimes those are the first things to go. So we're hopeful that we can get away, uh, do away with all the duplicative paperwork, the busy work, but also keep the mentoring for those new teachers. Now, uh, two quick more things. Uh, I was able to, uh, this past meeting, uh, pass a resolution at the State Board of Education that will authorize the Ohio Channel to broadcast our meetings. I don't know if any of you guys ever watch legislature, the Ohio Channel is the C-SPAN version uh, for Ohio. Now, I don't expect to uh, break viewing records by watching State Board of Education meetings, but to, what, to, to know what's going on with the State Board of Education, 1.7 million students, nearly 12, Ohio, 12 million Ohioans, yet employ a lobbyist or drive two hours to the meetings. I think it's important if people want easy access to their meetings that they should be able to pull them up on their laptop, pull them on their phone, watch the archive meetings. So starting September, you will be able to watch State Board of Education meetings live, online, possibly broadcast on your local access television channel if they bring them, and there'll be a video archive. So I'm excited about that. I think it's important. I don't know if you guys film for your local uh, cable channels. I'm, Sure you do, most districts of your size do. 
and that was my point to the state board, is that a lot of districts already do this, townships do this, county governments do this, it's ridiculous for a state board of education not to do this. So you'll be able to watch the meetings and hopefully, and my goal is that if we have more people watching our meetings, more people will engage with the state board and the high department of education and hopefully stop bad policy when they see it or offer recommendations to refine good policy. And then lastly, this is an issue that came up for a long period of time on Tuesday night. I have to tell you, this, this past uh, week I was in Columbus Monday and Tuesday, and we meet every second Monday and Tuesday of each month except for the month of August, and I need a month break after this past meeting. We started at 8.30 on Monday, finished at 8.30 in the morning, and finished at 7.20 at night. Tuesday, we started at 8.30 in the morning and finished at almost 8.30 at night. So it, it can be tiring. And then one of the last things we talked about was the third grade reading guarantee. And I know a lot of you probably in, are involved with that or are familiar with that. I don't think there's anyone in the room that doesn't understand the importance of a third grader needing the ability to read and being proficient because without Without being able to read, that just, of course, eliminates all the building blocks in subsequent years um, in school. But the issue is, is we have promotable scores and proficient scores. And what we're seeing, especially in the most the large districts who have high numbers, but not even other districts, I'm eager to find out from you guys what your numbers are, is that the promotable score, or the, the amount of kids um, not being promoted, it's almost doubled from last year. Now state law requires the proficiency rate, the promotable rate to reach the proficiency rate over a period of time. But it's a real concern that there's a lot of kids not being promoted to fourth grade due to some arbitrary mess up or a statistical anomaly. So I'm eager if anybody can share on that because I told one of my fellow board members that was gonna come here and find out what you guys are facing and maybe some of you have read it in dispatch or Cleveland Plain Dealer or some things like that. So with that being said, I look forward to that information and uh, any questions, I'm an open book. Uh, you know, I spoke quickly and on a lot of issues. Caught me just as I was coming in, so I had a lot of adrenaline. But um, you're right. Yes, Mr. Holmes. First of all, thank you for coming and appreciate you giving us an update on the state budget, graduation assessment, uh, third grade reading guarantee. One question I have regards uh, ECOT, the Educational Classroom of Tomorrow. Uh, they have been reporting, especially in year 15, 16, incorrect enrollment numbers to the tune of $60 million. And right now it's being proposed that uh, $2.5 million be deducted from the state foundation dollars that they'll be receiving. ECOT has said if they do that, then they'll have to probably close. Could you kind of give an update on, on yeah, that situation? Yeah. Um, have some strong views on this. Uh, well, first of all, I'm a public school person. I believe in public schools. I'm a champion for public schools. I think public schools are our beacons of our communities. I mean, for instance, uh, you guys are closer to the major city, just just like the the ring suburban cities or ring suburban school districts. However, as you go further east from here or go in other rural parts of Ohio, that that school district, that school is truly the center of activity for that town. I mean, as we all know, when certain teams go to state championship games, everyone's house is better be locked up uh, twice as much because everyone knows no one's home. So with all that being said, I, can, I am fully supportive of public education, K through 12, and Batavia growing up. Now, I'm also for choice. I, I benefited from choice as a junior and senior uh, high school student through the post-secondary enrollment option program, now College Credit Plus, so I think kids should have the ability to have choice in all different fashions. However, school districts, uh, and additionally, charter schools, community schools, that take public tax dollars must be accountable for those. I don't think it's right that a school district who gets traditional state share index tax dollars has to have all these strings on their money, and rightfully so, but a unelected governing board of a charter school does not have to follow those same gu guidelines. Again, I believe in choice, but it has to be accountable choice. It's gotta be transparent choice. So with regards to the ECOT, 
since we, I don't know if any of you read the Columbus Dispatch or saw the, the above the fold story, uh, ECOT loses three court cases in a matter of two hours. Yeah. One of those was a personal uh, suit against the State Board of Education for what they said was violations of the open meetings law, which was a complete hoax. First of all, uh, as the court decision, and as an attorney I can speak with this a little bit more fluently, as the court decision said in the Franklin County Common Police Court, we were acting in a quasi-judicial setting, so the public meetings requirements didn't even apply to us. But even if they did in that case, we did nothing improper. It was a completely litigious group. I never thought when I went to the State Board of Education that a few days after taking one of the uh, biggest votes I ever took on the State Board of Education, hopefully we'll have some more important ones that doesn't have to do with things like this, that it had to be chased by a process server trying to uh, issue me a subpoena of being sued and having to turn things over. The board voted, I think it was 16 to 1, one abstention um, to make ECOT pay that $60 million back, and the one person who voted no, frankly, messed up and meant to vote yes, that person was one of the most um, in, in, in private, one of the most frustrated people with ECOT. She actually wanted more money from ECOT and they got confused on the voting. So we, we voted pretty much unanimously with them paying it back. So we will see. I, I'm not here to put any online school out. I'm not uh, out of business. I'm not here to put ECOT out of business. But what I am here is for transparency and accountability and I, I, I'm very satisfied um, that the courts have agreed with the board, the board has agreed with the courts, and that that process of recoupment will start this month. Uh, they do have a two-year period, and how it works mechanically is they get all this state uh, funding, just like Beaver Creek would, but instead of getting, for instance, I'm just throwing a number out there, $10 million a month, which they normally would, they'll get $7.5 million. So they say they're paying it back they're just not getting as much money in their future payments. So yes, they're, they are paying it back, uh, but they're not truly paying it back. It's just less money that they're getting for their school. So I don't know if that was a long enough way to answer for you. Yes. I'd like to talk about test. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. I'd like to ask you about testing. Yes. So you said that the state is 24, tests and federal is 17, but two have been taken away. So there's still 39 tests. No, no, no. Is that what so you're it's, saying? Uh, no, it's 24 overall tests the state requires, which includes the federal government tests. Okay, I didn't know and, and of that 24, 17 are embedded in that. Okay. And actually, we're down to 22. Now, we did um, have an interesting speaker say, she actually, uh, this past week, that she believes we have 23 tests because all the juniors are mandated to take the ACT or SAT. However, I might not get all agreements in here. I think that's the greatest thing in the world for this reason. It's paid for, and the kid who might not otherwise think he's college material is forced to sit in that room, and you never know, he might pop a 26 or a 27, and that test, sitting for those three hours, has changed his life forever. And I say that because I'm a first-generation college graduate. One of the biggest barriers for me just to go to law school was the thought of taking the LSAT. I took the LSAT and got and moved along. I know that kids have barriers of entry because they're unfamiliar with that test. And to think that the state paying for a test and having a kid sit in that seat could truly change their life because when you go, when you come from a perspective of a first generation college graduate, your parents want the best for you, but they can't help you with where to sign up in classes. They can't help with you where to take a prep class. They can't help you to know that you better uh, time yourself on that test. But what that test by the state mandating that puts a kid in that situation. So I want that test to stay because I think it's an opportunity test. So we're down to 22. We do hope to recommend further to the legislature. I, I am a big believer in taking the level of testing down as far as we can go. I think, I, I think frankly, that too much testing, I see this the pendulum. The pendulum has swung completely to the too much testing thing. And my thing is, let's swing, I, I don't like to swing it all the way back. I think I'd rather find that sweet spot middle. But I, I say, let's have less testing. Let's see it works out. And, uh, and I'm confident that local districts will, 
will provide education to kids in that we don't need the state with a thumb on them to always force them uh, to find some efficiency. Well, I must say with this, with, with the assessments, and I've said this in a, a, a few articles as well, is that teachers a lot of times judged on their growth. So if a kid goes from a C plus, let's, let's see, if a kid goes from a uh, D minus to a D plus, or a D minus to a C minus, that's not much growth. The states will say that's, that's not much growth. Well, but what the state does not know when they get those teacher evaluations, does the kid come in drug free? Does the kid come in with a smile on his face? Does the kid come up and look? Is the kid wanting to go to uh, school next year? Is the kid staying away from the bad kids? Does that kid see opportunity in himself for the future? We don't test that. Because that's not something, we don't assess that, we don't judge that with teachers because that's something that's not easily accessible. But just because it's not easily accessible doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do it. And so that's my push is, you know, there's, there's a lot of things in this world, whether you're going to college or you're going to a career, there's a lot more things about succeeding in life than making sure you pass, get 18 points out of 35 on any course exam. Now, I understand there's some people even that live in this area that don't think that's a good idea. But I'm a big believer that a kid uh, needs, uh, that a kid or a, a future adult needs those, knows up when to show up on time, get out of bed at a normal time, uh, open a door for someone, have a smile on their face, want to learn, want to work hard. That's what makes people great, not whether or not they get an important score on a test. Uh, I would really like to thank you for coming, even though you've already been thanked by two of my esteemed colleagues. This is my 14th year on the school board. Um, I have seen just such a great disconnect between well, there's no connect between the state school board and, and the actual school boards, you know, out in the districts. And I think it's a really good thing to come and um, meet the people that are here. In the, in the time that I've been on the board here in this district, we saw one other state representative that came when our football field, remember when we opened the, the new field, they came and gave an award to us for not for the field, but you know, for something uh, just out of the blue, didn't come to the meeting or anything, but I, I think it's important. I, I, I do too. I was telling uh, your superintendent's uh, secretary that she said, well, can you have to schedule at the beginning? I said, it, it's okay. I, I like being at the beginning, but I want to hear what's going on. And I plan to stay. And I want to know about what's going on with school buses. I want to know what's going on with your cafeteria employees. I want to know what's going on with your curriculum choices. It gives me a, a real understanding. And it's my, been my goal, although I found that summer months are a little harder. And, uh, and, but it's my goal to visit about three to five local boards a month. And of course, I've cherry-picked some of my local ones because I just uh, uh, drive quickly there. So I'm about 12. 12, 13 local school districts at this point. I started in uh, January, so it's my hope to uh, to get to every school district, frankly. I think I have over 50 at least, but I, I'm gonna try and uh, try my best. It's a nice thing during the evening so it doesn't conflict with my day job, but I, I think it's important. I, I think it's important to know what's going on. And, and you know, to your point about accessibility in the State Board of Education, I don't wanna ask anybody to raise their hands, but there's probably at least half a dozen people in here that didn't even know what a State Board of Education was before we even had such a thing. And I think that's frankly not broadcasting your meetings, not having people reach out. And so I, I think one of the dynamics of that is, is we are a hybrid board. I wish we were an all-elected board. Of course, I'm biased. I'm an elected member. But I think when you have eight appointees by the governor, with no constituency other than maybe one person, and that's the sitting governor at the time, that there's not as much, and you can see it in the conversation at the board meetings. You can see where there's people like the third grade reading guarantee where we're having issues in these school districts. And I haven't had any districts approach me about this being an issue, but you, you can see the passion in the members who've heard it from their districts. And then, but you can see the appointed members like, oh, we care, but, like they just don't, I think you're invested more when you have to, and, 
want to politely tell my fellow members at times to appoint at once and say, go visit. Go, go talk to people, because you're going to have a different perspective. We appreciate it, man. Any audience, I, any audience I'm, uh, just because you're not a board member, anybody else, I'm here, I'll be staying around. Don't be shy, yeah. I was just going to say, I met you at the Summer Leadership Academy. Yeah, yeah, we're, uh, yeah, yeah. That was a good time. Right, I mean, Columbus, there were three board members <coughs> there, and they were so open and so honest, and you took lots of questions. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I, I'm saying the same things I said there, so I'm not. No, I, it was, you, it's you, awesome. I'm glad you, to hear it again. And you, you were, you took lots of questions, mm -hmm. and you were very open with us, and I appreciate all that. I think you guys are great. And I went to one school board meeting. It's been a few months ago, but the one I've been on, or uh, mm, it, it might have been in the fall. Okay, see, so it was right. before. You that's a different board. board. That's a that's a yeah. board that doesn't like to. This board works together, so. Right. But it's, it's a very interesting process, and I appreciate you coming here. Thank you. It's awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much, Nick. Appreciate you coming. Thank you.
She's provided leadership to her team at all levels, and I can't begin to tell you how important that is. Uh, it provides uh, mentorship to all of our new staff, and when you provide your experience to all of our new staff, that is the most valuable uh, leadership tool that anybody can provide. And I thank you for, for doing that over the years, uh, Donna. So. Um, you've just been a real asset to the department, and, and uh, whenever I've called upon you, you've always been there to serve. So uh, I, you have followed through with all of our wonderful uh, nutrition education projects and made sure that uh, all the students are receiving uh, the nutritious meals that they deserve to, to be successful in school. Because that's what we're here for, is to be that support. Because we all know that a hungry child cannot learn. And that is so, so vital to their learning, is that they have the right nutrition so that they can tackle the day's uh, assignments and so forth. Um, during the past 27 years, Donna has seen a lot of changes. We used to have tickets. Now we have these fancy computer point of sale systems. And uh, um, you've seen a lot of renovations of kitchens over the years. Uh, Beaver Creek High School was a huge one back in the day. Uh, Main Elementary, um, Ferguson Hall has gone through quite a bit as well too. So you've gone through all of that, and not to mention all the pains it takes when you are in the middle of renovation and trying to serve school meals on top of it. But Donna came through and she was there for us, so that's awesome. Um, Donna Lucas was also recognized by the School Nutrition Association of Ohio with her Buckeye Service Award for 25 years of service. Uh, to uh, two children and to the child nutrition um, career that she has led. So I wanted to say thank you so much on behalf of Beaver Creek City School Student Nutrition Department and all the students that you have served. Thank you so very much. Uh, you have a wonderful, well-deserved retirement. plaque for you presented to Donna Lucas on your retirement in recognition of your outstanding service in student nutrition Beaver Creek with Beaver Creek City Schools, the Beaver Creek Board of Education 2017. Thanks. students to share new learning, especially in the science area. 
Bell had a positive attitude and supported staff members, as he was always willing to recognize others' points of view and made it a point to connect to staff at Shaw by greeting people and saying goodbye at the end of the day. He was a good sport, as he was so outnumbered by his female co-workers. Since he worked with all women on his team, he learned to say, whatever you guys want. <laughs> good move. Sure. He also was very good at sitting through lunch with us, no matter what the conversation was. Bill served in the United States Air Force and helped students understand the importance of being patriotic. He always dressed up on casual Fridays, way more than any other day of the week. He always encouraged people to be healthy and supported several of us to run in our first 5Ks with him. The one thing that stands out to me is that Bill was the one who instigated our fifth grade buddies. About 15 years ago, he came to me wondering if I would be interested in letting his fifth graders come to listen to my students read. He knew that first graders needed the practice and he wanted to build his students' confidence. We started out simply by having my students read to his for 15 minutes, once a week. As the year went on, his buddy project took on a life of its own. My students wrote to the fifth graders, and we started doing science experiments together. His students taught my students about science concepts that were working on that closely supported our science concepts. We share our science learning with our buddies, too. They would come down when the eggs hatched, when we made ice cream, promotion experiments, and lots of other things. What Bill and I didn't anticipate was the impact this would have on our students. My first graders idolized the fifth graders. When we would pass them in the hall, the faces of both classes lit up with joy. They were rock stars to my students. This was a great opportunity to build responsibility in the fifth graders, too. They started to think about someone else other than themselves. That first year went so well that we made it a priority to continue this collaboration. I am really going to miss this. I know that Bill deeply cared about his students. When we would walk after school, we would often talk about our day and the experiences with the students. We would try to problem solve issues with students. He helped me to have a better understanding about boys and how they think. Bill was one of the first to jump into project-based learning that we just started this year with Gusto. He brought in an electrician to help students learn, then coached them through the project, where they created some pretty fantastic displays for the public audience. He got so excited about what this learning would bring to the students while he was planning and bounced ideas off of others often. Then as the students were finishing their projects, he encouraged teachers to bring their students through for his students to explain their learning. Bill's energy and enthusiasm for student learning will be missed. We will miss his straightforward, helpful questions during staff meetings and his willingness to try all of the crazy ideas that all of us women at Shaw ask him to. Thank you, Bill, for being the token male for us last year. Enjoy your travels, and drop us a line once in a while, please. We wish you well. What a beautiful thing that they wrote about you. Oh, my gosh. And this is presented to William Sorensen on your retirement and recognition of your outstanding service as a teacher with Beaver Creek City Schools, Beaver Creek Board of Education, 2017. Thank you. Uh, you know, I wrote a, a letter. I can say a couple words. Good. I wrote a letter to Darren, and um, I had a lot of uh, time to write about what I what my experiences were in the teaching profession, but before I go there, um, I want to thank David Millen, because he's the guy that hired me. Uh, somebody might remember Dave. And uh, also Mary Rose, because she's the one that left the position that I filled, so I was going to get that position in fifth grade. Uh, 
Uh, you hit upon some very good points, you know. Um, I've always uh, uh, did my best, and I think I had results to show the academic side of things. So I was always uh, comfortable with the academics. I knew my students would be well prepared in mathematics, in science, in reading, in social studies when I went on to the next grade level. But I always thought, as you indicated, that the student themselves, uh, who they really were, I think that is always missed in the grand scheme of, of student education. And I'll just share a couple examples that you can probably take with you. Uh, simple things. Uh, you know, like being called uh, dad, being called uncle, never called granddad, thank you. Uh, being called mom. I was, I was called mom just last year, too, so twice in my career was I called mom. But I think that shows an affinity that they have with the person. Uh, secondly, I had a special ed student in my class, and uh, his father came to me one day and said, you know, uh, Juan, when he says his prayers every evening, includes you in his prayers, and I'm so grateful to hear that because it made that year an easy year for me. So his prayers were working for me that year. Uh, I taught third grade for one year, and this little girl fell down on the floor, and she's uh, on the ground, she scraped her knee, and I went over, and I brushed her up, and I said, no, you're gonna be okay, it's gonna work out for you. Well, two years later in fifth grade, she comes up to me and says, Mr. Sorensen, I'm so thankful that day. You remember that day on the playground when I fell and he came over? And I said, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. You know, so I touched her. And there are a few others too, but I want to just finish up with the last one. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we do have some challenging students even in Beaver Creek, not, and challenged uh, in a different way. Uh, I, had a, I had a student in fourth grade last year, a great kid. Uh, you know, I'll call him Brandon, that's not his name. And uh, then we go on a field trip, and we're, we're coming back from the field trip, and uh, we're, we're sitting together, and he's a, he's a little boy that needs a little bit more attention. And so we're sitting on the bus together, on, on the same seat, and he looks over to me and he says, Mr. Sorensen, uh, I don't know how we got on this place. Is it? You know, I don't, I don't even know who my father is. And uh, so he's living with his grandmother, and he seldom sees his grandmother. So I'm like, wow. And he looked upon me to be that father image for him. Uh, you know, how do you quantify that? You can't. You know, you can't. And so the beauty of all this that I was able to experience is nearly every day last year when he was a fifth grader, he would come to my class first thing in the morning and he would give me a hug. That might have only been the first hug that he had that day, the only hug he had that day. But that was part of the reason, one of the reasons why I went into teaching. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, we all don't miss that, because that's very important, uh, intangible, I think, that teachers bring. I gave my perspective from a male, and I'm sure the female teachers are doing the same thing too throughout. No more other uh, experiences like that. I do want to thank uh, my, the staff that came. Uh, fantastic. I, I feel really great and blessed that you're able to make it this evening. Uh, Patty, wow. You know, the story, stories that we shared together on some of those walks were fantastic. Allie, I mean, you got all kinds of great energy going for you. I just hope that continues and uh, don't get frustrated. Sometimes uh, some teachers want to dig their heels in, but you know, just keep pressing on, you know. And Barb, thanks for coming. Uh, awesome. This lady has worked so many years now as a secretary for the, uh, the union, and she's done a great job. And I know all three of them give like 110% each and every day they're in the classroom. Thank you so much. Thank you. Donna thank you for your service. Thank you so much. You will be missed, both of you. All right, thank you.
And you're, what, you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to go. <laughs> oh, Purchase order certification. June 2017 donated items. 
fiscal year 18 certificate of estimated resources resolution to approve updated 457 plan adoption agreement resolution to approve new administrative pay periods and the approval of resolution declaring intent to proceed with election of the question of substitution of an emergency tax levy. Second. Discussion. So items A through F are in the typical housekeeping year end, fiscal year end things that we have to do. We close out the June 2017 books and the fiscal year 2017. Um, on page 120, we go through our monthly analysis there. For the year, we ended our receipts $85,000 less than anticipated. So um, just negative 0.1% of our total revenue estimation. Um, for our salaries, we ended the year expending um, $288,897 less than anticipated. So that was within 0.34% of our five-year forecast. Any questions, Paul? The only comment that I would make is you almost sound an apologetic, but the fact that your estimates on, re on uh, revenues were 99.9% and your estimates on expenditures at 99.66%, uh, that's pretty doggone good. Uh, so congratulations to the entire treasurer's office. Thank you. And thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Um, the PowerPoint basically goes into a little bit more detail of the monthly analysis and for the fiscal year end. Um, we'll move on to the uh, June reconciliation. Um, it just goes through our cash balances. Um, the cash balance at the end of the year was $42,828,000 for all funds in the district. So that's general fund for an improvement, you know, grants, that kind of thing. Um, we saw another $35,000 um, in interest income for June, which is also very good. Um, moving on to the fiscal year end transfers and advances. This is something that we have to do at the end of each fiscal year because one of our funds is going to be negative. So that's all for our grades that for expenditures in June that we had for our grant funds. Um, next, we'll go through the ORC purchase order certification. This is just purchases over $3,000 that we have um, that have made before purchase order, but the board's obligated to approve. And then we go for our June um, donated items. And then um, after we close books, we send our new FY18 Certificate of Estimated Resources to the Green County Auditor. That's on page 150. So we can put in our um, initial appropriations and estimated revenue for them to certify. So that is. And next, we're at um, item H now, which is a resolution to approve the updated 457 plan adoption agreement. This goes along with the recommendation from OASCO. Um, Currently, it's just with VOYA, so VOYA is the only provider that can offer a 457 plan. They're adding NAPSAC Global as a provider, so as a district, we're going to include them as well for more options for the employees. Um, item I is a resolution to approve new administrator pay periods. With school starting earlier, the new administrators, so this is their first year in the district, they would have to wait almost a full month for their first paycheck. So we are we have a resolution that Sabashi drafted for us in order so we can pay them to start here. And then item J is the, the last piece of the um, levy resolutions to get the substitution of the emergency levy on the back of that. Any questions? Employment salary changes, leave of absence, terminations, job descriptions, approval of resolution to participate in the free and reduced lunch program at all Beaver Creek City Schools and the free and reduced breakfast program at Beaver Creek High School, Ferguson Hall, and Parkway Elementary School. Approval of NIOLA policy 2464, gift education identification. 
Approval of tentative agreement of the Beaver Creek Classified Employees Association. Approval of resolution for pra practical transportation. And approval of student handbooks 2017 and 18. So Second. Any discussion? Okay, I would just like to share with the board a few items on here. Uh, some of these are boilerplate items that we approve every month. Um, obviously, A is, is a big time of year where we're accepting resignations and hiring. And I'm very pleased to say that I believe we are almost fully staffed with just a few positions that we are still looking to fill. Um, the item B, I would like to first of all congratulate and thank Connie Little. She's really been the one spearheading our uh, breakfast program, so we're excited to have that not only at Beaver Creek High School, but having a, at Ferguson as well in Parkwood. Um, the only policy, you'll notice it's just one policy, and we need to have that in place for the start of the school year, because those have, that has been changed, so we need to get that in place. And item D, we're very excited to be uh, finished negotiations with our classified union and board approval on this tonight. We'll, assist the treasurer's department in making sure that everybody's paid uh, with the new uh, contract. So we're excited about that. I want to uh, thank Greg Thompson who led that group and um, it, it was a great process. Uh, a lot of items to cover but we feel that as Greg said we feel we're a stronger district for what we were able to do. And then item E is, is a typical item for uh, those students that uh, may attend a parochial school or a private school and uh, there's not enough there for us to use a bus to transport. And finally, I do have, if you need some light reading, uh, the student handbooks for this upcoming year, so you are welcome uh, to come and get that or uh, it'll be in my office. We always keep it in my office, so at any time you're welcome to look at it. Uh, but that would conclude new business items for board action. Any other discussion? Is the handbook, student handbook, also published online? That is a very good question. I believe it is on each school's right. website. Yes, it is. It is. Glad you asked that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. I just okay. wanted to comment on one of the employment I uh, uh, items. John Salag, yeah. how you say it? Um, he's been the head custodian at Fairbrook for, I don't even know, for a really long time. He's just does such an amazing job. and. That building runs like a well-oiled machine, and now he's been promoted to um, over assistant building the ground supervisor. So I'm excited to see him get that recognition. And That's what happens when you do a good job? Yep, yep. Fairbrook is going to be missing him for sure. Okay, Ms. Arnold. Yes. Mr. Taylor. Yes. Ms. Hunt. Yes. Mr. Morrison. Yes. Ms. Rogano. Yes. Motion carries. And we're to announcements. Um, Next Beaver Creek Board of Education meeting is August 17th, 6.30, right here in this room. And um, the first day of school for 2017-18 school year is August 16th. That's a Wednesday. Wow, it's hard to, I know it's hard to believe that. Summer's almost gone. We're halfway through July. It's like, okay. Um, and we're at board comments. We're going to start with Mrs. Arnold. Um, I've just been vacationing my heart out this year. I mean, between the Caribbean and I, my uh, 12 days in New Jersey. Um, so they're on Facebook in the ocean. Floating around yeah. in the ocean and visiting Long Beach Island. And I actually caught up with um, some cousins that I haven't seen in 50 years. What a, oh my gosh. We've got a great reunion. And we have put in place we're going to literally have a reunion next year. On the beach. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's the tradition to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crazy not to see. Mr. My, my dad died when I was 10, and these are the relatives from his side, so I kind of lost touch, you know, yeah. some touch there. But uh, happy to be back and happy to be looking forward to a wonderful school year then. That's hard to believe, right? It's very it's going by faster and faster. Buzzes, but the longer they're on the board, the faster the sun goes. You have to go on vacation for the okay. Get it over. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Teal. Okay, uh, a couple things. One, of course, retirement always uh, remind me that uh, we we stand on the shoulders of giants. 
of the people who've come for us that have paved the way uh, and led the way to make, in our case, Beaver Creek what it is today. So we're so excited. Uh, and uh, Mr. Sorensen, of course, and I taught together uh, at Shaw School um, for many years. And uh, it turns out he and I have the same birthday, about a decade apart. <laughs> He's obviously much older. Too many left. Who would have known? Oh, uh, and also, uh, Mr. Owens, of course, it, it reminds me uh, that uh, just uh, one example, of course, televising uh, the meetings of the board uh, is that, of course, good communication, of course, leads to engagement, people's interest, which leads to relevancy because that has been one of the problems, uh, not just the state school board, but in any of these types of, of boards, uh, getting people uh, engaged uh, and see the relevancy of, uh, of, of what it is that we do as a, as a state system, as a local system. So I congratulate you on that. So, other than that, all is well. That's great. Okay, um, enjoying summer with family, excited to leave for vacation this weekend. We're taking ours a little later this year. My husband's traveling for work a lot. My husband actually went to UD Law School and um, was an assistant prosecutor in Greene County for many years and is now a federal assistant prosecutor. So it's interesting to hear your background, very similar to what he does. Um, he's actually in Texas doing some work now for his office. So. Um, we've had a busy summer. Um, this is an election year for some of us on the board, and I submitted my petitions this week, so I'm excited about that opportunity. Mr. Morrison. So I wish everybody a happy summer. I'd like to congratulate Mr. Otten on a very successful first year. I hope it's the first of May. Thanks. I appreciate it. He's not allowed to leave. That was part of the contract. <laughs> you see that in there? Uh, <laughs> Just so okay. Good. Read the fine print before you sign it. <laughs> it's time for um, thank you very much for coming down. We really appreciate this. You know, the more transparent we can be, the better it is. Because you know what? And when you're transparent, I would hope that people really understand what's going on. That's a problem. And so they don't feel something's being hidden. I mean, that is so critical as far as I'm concerned. Transparency leads to trust. So I really, sincerely, really appreciate you coming down here, and we hope you come see us again. Yeah. This summer is going by fast. I've lived vicariously through our teachers on Facebook. You know, and I keep saying, oh, look, Tanya Olstead's in France, and um, Julie Kerr's over here, and over here in Italy, and, and I just keep saying to my husband, oh, this is so exciting. And he says, yeah, well, we used to do that, but we're not allowed to leave this country now because of you. I said, oh, yeah, well, okay. So, but, you know, I'm happy for these yeah, I know, I got this thing about leaving this country right now, so Charlie said, so be really, I know, I'm so excited for these people, so I really appreciate them letting me live through them this summer. They just don't know it. We did go to New York, and we got stuck at the Chicago airport on cots for the night, but that was an adventure, you know, really, it was. This guy, you know, was walking around the airport in his pajamas. I mean, now, come on, people, let's not, I mean, this was not the help, but the Chicago airport, if you want to be stuck somewhere overnight, they are well equipped at 4 o'clock in the morning they wake you up and they hand you these toiletry kits and they vacuum around you in the middle of the night. It's really, it was an adventure, yeah. Was, oh, really? You don't even want to know the rest of the story, but we're good. So they ever gave me a cot when I had to You know, it's amazing. Out of it. What? Yeah. I think Chicago's well equipped because they're always I'm delaying and Well, I'm just flights. saying we're 10 hours in the morning. <laughs> then I'm saying we're ready to take off and pilot says, Mechanical error, we got a problem. Like, and I felt bad because when we got to Chicago after 10 hours in New York, and we all these people were on said, Oh my gosh, I feel so bad for these people. I didn't know that six hours later I was going to beat one of those people. So, but it was, no, really, it was like, Be careful what you, you know. I did feel bad for them, but this guy walking around these little short pajamas, I'm like, with his towel and toothbrush, I'm like, Yeah, okay, whatever makes you happy. So he made himself at home, and like my son said, we were there with. Thousands of our friends, <laughs> really, closest friends. And you know what, now one person at an airport complained, people were so nice to each other.
each other, probably because they were freezing with sub-zero in the airport, but that's another story too. Anyway, I don't, thank you all for coming tonight. We always love to have you here. Um, we hope to see you next month, and um, we're going into executive session, so I'm going to need a motion to second for to take us into the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of public employees, policy 121, Point two two G one and no action will be taken following the executive session at this meeting. I need a motion and a second to get us in here. Second. Okay. Have a great rest of July.